All right. Well, uh, I'll just get right to it because so today's sort of happy hour in the midst of this madness. Two poems for the price of one. So here's the first one. Again, just where is God in all this kind of violent mess that you find yourself caught up in? This poem, uh, both poems will be in uh, the uh, mailing tomorrow, by the way. This is a poem that's called The Way Things Are. And uh, I remember reading a book by this same name by Houston Smith years ago, or as a conversation with Houston Smith, the, the great uh, philosopher who uh, wrote the religions of, uh, I think the original title was Religions of Man. I think it was changed, Religions of the World. It's a world religion guy, standard text for world religions. And uh, uh, he inspired this poem, even though it was years ago when I read it. Life comes to each of us like a mysterious Rorschach blot. People fall into four views in the way that they'd interpret life. Hypothesis one, the atheist, there is no God. Hypothesis two, the polytheist, there are many gods. Hypothesis three, the monotheist, there's only one God. Hypothesis four, the mystic. There is only God. One, many, one, and only. Using God as a, a kind of universal rubric, these are the four ways we can interpret life. And there's no way to prove which is right. I encourage each of you to choose the most meaningful hypothesis and then give your whole heart and soul to the practice of living in accord with it. So uh, there's really like four possible views of all this and God is, is a kind of universal rubric or, or uh, structure to where you can can say what you're seeing out here when you look out the atheists there's no god polytheists there are many gods monotheists like uh uh jew the jewish religion islam and in christianity there's only one god and but then the, the mystic which there's mystics in all major religions and even nature mystics that have existed for a long time they said there's only God. So none, many, one, and only. And so uh, these are the four ways that you can really interpret life through this rubric of what we call God, this sound, these three letters. And then, the, but there's no way to prove which is right. So what, what do you do? You, you know, I encourage each of you to choose the most meaningful, meaningful hypothesis. Now, hypothesis is a theory that you you tried to prove. Uh, scientific language, and uh, which one is the most meaningful? No God, many gods, one gods, only God. Which is the most meaningful to you personally? And then give your whole heart and soul to the practice of living in accord with it. That's the key part. You choose, and then you you know your whole life is a, it should be a sense of living in accord with it, in accord with this hypothesis. I grew up Catholic, uh, you know. I grew up with all that instruction, and uh, you know can remember people driving out of the uh, parking lot after mass, giving the finger, or cutting people off. Well, <laughs> I mean, you know. There's, there's saying what you believe, and I'm not saying to believe anything. I'm saying choose the most meaningful hypothesis, the mo most meaningful view of all of this, and, uh, and then try to live in accord with it. And I've been all over the, all over the map with this one uh, myself in 72 years. And uh, I, 
you know, I'm firmly now in the last one. Uh, the, the music we had as you were coming in was uh, Van Morrison and his famous song, Into the Mystic, Into the Mystic. And uh, I like to, you know, I, I feel the most meaningful is the mystic hypothesis for me. Might not be for you, but, uh, and I'm trying to live in accord with it. Say, a mystic sees every, you know, it's only God. Uh, when I trained with the Trappist, they were, they're mystics to be. You know, when I walked in, the first thing I saw, the first time I came there with a bunch of boys from Houston was God alone was chiseled in stone over the retreat house. God alone. This is all God. We're all manifestations of God. That's a mystic view. It's again like the ocean and wave parable I've, I've used on occasion, that was my favorite parable. Every, every wave is all ocean all the time, every wave. So I'm looking around here, we got the kids in the park out front of Elizabeth's, we got the trees, the mosquitoes, <laughs> even the mosquitoes, uh, all manifestations of, of the one. Yeah, so here's a, a poem coming from this point of view. Uh, that was called The Way Things Are. I think he got choices. Uh, somebody uh, asked Colbert one time about being an agnostic. And um, he said, well, uh, he, he said, you're an atheist without balls, without being able to make a choice and to live accordingly. And that might be a little harsh. I think there's a sense of confusion, of course, but the thought that really say, I don't know. Yeah, okay, but uh, how meaningful is that? So I guess we could add a fifth one if that's, if that's your choice. But this is, uh, would be uh, a view of, of God from the mystic point of view. And uh, this poem's called The Whole Shebang. Shebang was a word that, uh, you've heard this term, I'm sure, oh, the whole shebang. Uh, it came, it was uh, created during the um, Civil War. Actually, Walt Whitman used it. And uh, shebang meant a, a dwelling place. And it was probably a very primitive dwelling place. A dwelling place. But uh, I, I like that title for, for this mystic view into, into the absolute reality, which is called God. God. God is. God is a verb. God is the spirit. God is isness without limit. For the mystic, there's only God. Love just this. Taste just this. Live in God. A little short poem because the word itself, even though it's about absolute, ultimate, total reality, a little short word, little three letters in English and just a single syllable, God. It's amazing to try to pack in that, in that, in that short little sound, all of ultimate reality. But uh, this does it for me. This is meaningful for me. God. God is. God is a verb. God is spirit. God is isness without limit. For the mystic, there's only God. Love just this. Taste just this. Live in God. Yeah, Van uh, Morrison, who is a, he's a modern mystic, you know, uh, <laughs> Northern Belfast mystic, grew up in Belfast, Northern Ireland, but he's got a song. He said, when will we ever learn how to live in God? It's a great song. When will we ever learn how to live in God? That's a mystic perspective that we're always in God. Um, when will we learn that? 
and it is a learning process. How do you live in accord with this? That's, I, I, I think most of you, if you wouldn't be here uh, if you're a diehard atheist. Uh, although, as I told you, I mean, I had a young girl who came for a retreat and then thought she'd made a mistake. And she said, I, I, I think I made a mistake. Um, I'm an atheist and we have all these religious pictures here. And I said, well, tell me about this God that oh, you don't believe in. Well, we had, she, I, I just let her talk and it just only went on for about five minutes. Old white guy, very sort of indictive, uh, all these rules, crime and punishment. Uh, you know, what's the, the God most of us learned about, the God who, you know, if you did the right thing, he, he would love you and it was a he. And if you, uh, did the wrong thing, well, you know, you could be banished forever in the flames of hell and all that. We all learned that uh, tiny God, which as Hafez would talk, call that God, a tiny God. Uh, and th th that God was not down here, that God was up there. And so she went on for about five minutes. And, and then when she finished, I said, that about it? And she said, yeah, yeah, don't believe in that. I said, well, I don't either. And she said, really? And I said, yeah. And so in the course of a weekend, what was really, and the woman spent, the young girl spent most of the time outside in the front by the fish pond and then walking around, walking the road. And then we sat a couple of times and rode and talked, but most of her time was spent outside. And I said, and then I gave her these four choices. And she said, well, I think, you know, I am a mystic. And I said, yeah, I think so too. You're a nature mystic. There's different kinds of mystics, of course. You know, everything is this variety, you know, unbelievable variety. There are not just four types of people out there, not just four worlds we're seeing. It's just such a variety. But she's, I said, how does it feel to be leaving as a mystic? And she says, oh, a lot better, <laughs> a lot better, you know. And I said, you know, uh, that last line, if you're a mystic, you have to love just this, just this moment, just this emotion just this just depression, just this um, madness, just this anger. And that was what you know, last week's poem was about, was whatever it is, you greet it all kindly. And you, you know, there's none of this to life for a mystic. Rumi, who is a great, he was a great mystic, he said, uh, open your arms if you want to be held. There's none of this stuff for a mystic. And that's, you know, that's pretty challenging. Uh, we had we had in all times of that of my life we've had one mystic uh, prize fighter and that was uh, Muhammad Ali. The only guy who ever stood in the ring was somebody who was out to knock his block off with his hands down because he could, of course. Uh, but he he had this faith though too that there was something more than. Uh, you know, he caught a lot of grief because he would, he would do his Muslim prayers in the corner before he went out and fought. But he was something more than just a prize fighter. But he was a guy who, it was, it's an icon. He went into the ring, which we're all in, because there's always somebody trying to take a poke at you in this life, one way or another. Now it's, it's even obvious, you could just be in Pam's off uh, shopping for a dinner tonight. Is that safe? in this world, you know? But to, to have this un, unarmed love kind of approach, you know, to be open to the world, love just this, taste just this, this taste and see, the thing that comes from a Christian hymn and Christian Psalms, taste and see. Everything is to be tasted, which means to be experienced. Life is here to be experienced because it's all some form of the beloved. The breeze, even infirmity and illness. What if, what if you didn't try to resist anything and you just loved it because that's what is? And Thomas Keating, the, one of my great teachers, the guy who really started the contemplative practice of centering prayer give, to give Christians some way to, to access the, the spirit. He's, he, he lived to be 94 and a half, and he was just, he, he said, uh, 
I, I, Tarjani said, I've experienced every infirmity known to man except for one, Alzheimer's. He says, so <laughs> he says, well, he said, it'd be great if I wasn't aware of all this stuff, but if, you know, every, but he, he learned to welcome them all. When you, when you read this stuff, the interviews with towards the end of his life, it's all the manifestation of the spirit. And he met them all with kindness and perseverance. We just have to persevere through some tough times. Yeah, but it depends on how you see the world. You know, love just this, taste just this, live in God. Uh, I blow people's minds sometimes where out of the blue, I'll just say, what's your view of the soul? We're not ready for that kind of question in this culture. Now, now if you were ancient Greeks, you'd been taught that if you're at least ancient male white Greeks, you would have been talking about the soul, the psyche. Psychology was supposed to be the study of the soul. So I'll ask you, what about the soul? And uh, it's, it, uh, it's a total like paradigm shift when you realize that you don't have a soul, you are a soul. That's a total paradigm shift. And uh, that you are a soul. You're not just uh, this body in a mass of you know, chemicals and whatever, you are a soul. You don't have a soul like you have a vocation because if you have a soul, uh, you have a car, you can lose a car. You have a fortune, you can lose a fortune, but you are a soul. What does that mean? Uh, in, in the terms we've been using in dialogue here for some times, it, it, that your soul is your body, your mind, and your heart. These are the components. This is very classical, really, when you look into classical look. Uh, we talk about the three operating systems that you have, but you have the body and all of its sen sensitivity to incoming sensation, you have the mind, and then you have the heart. And it's a kind of, we're talking about a kind of evolution and upgrading of operating systems. That is what we mean by soul, at least what I mean by it. And the fact that you can handle whatever comes up with that apparatus. Although, unless, unless you develop the heart, you really, you, you can't deal with the toughest stuff. And uh, without a heart, that ability of the heart, which is a kind of totally different operating system than the, than the body or the mind, uh, it's very hard to really have a good relationship. And I won't go into all the details of that, but maybe on a later date. But so, and that soul is your individual manifestation of of ultimate reality, which we, you know, call God. And so if you can unpack God, you can actually still use that language. Uh, it is a kind of universal rubric in the West. You know, the Muslim is talking about Allah, you know, and if you're, and we're talking with Hindus, they would have many gods that have different flavors and different provinces, you know, uh, to what they, what they deal with as the Greeks did. The Greeks had a whole bunch of gods. So whatever is the most meaningful, but then to, to say, all right, I, this is the most meaningful hypothesis. And then I'm, the main thing is to say, all right, I'm gonna live in accord with that. You know, most people in the modern world, they got their ego. What, what, what's bigger than the ego? The 12 steps, when he talks about when, um, the guy who wrote the 12 steps talked about the higher power. He meant, you better have something higher than your ego. You better have it. Otherwise you're capable of what we've seen, what we, we know can happen everywhere from war on an international level to this kind of, these kind of shooting sprees that we deal with uh, in this country. Yeah. So, uh, so now when we go into the, uh, to the next uh, uh, part of our meeting, we're actually, um, we're trying to sit in contemplative silence, which is the practice of letting the heart operate. 
and then notice we let go of the thinking. We lay those thoughts aside gently because we're going deeper. We're going to something that is just it's a kind of somatic resonance with what is. Okay. And so it's practice in developing and updating this hard operating system. So, all right. I think that's enough. Let's let's get down to a little practice here. <laughs>